Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. Um, as we talk about the participation engagement in cancer genome sequencing, <clears throat> excuse me, or PECGS network. Um, we are excited to have you here today with us um, as we welcome Dr. Fields as well. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few things. Um, after Dr. Fields' presentation, we're going to have um, a few minutes that we can answer some questions. So feel free to leave those on the panel on the right side of your screen, um, and we can address, address them when the time comes. Um, if you're wanting to share this webinar with anybody or just revisit it at a later date, we will have it on our website. Um, you can visit fightcrc.org to find that. And if you'd like, you can also tweet along with us at hashtag fightcrc web or hashtag what CRC webinar, <laughs> sorry. Um, with that, um, today's presenter, we have Dr. Ryan Fields. He is the Chief, Surgical Onco Chief of Surgical Oncology at Washington University School of Medicine and the Alvin J. Seitman Center. He is a translational sci scientist who treats solid tumors, including pancreatic cancer, um, primary and metastatic liver cancers, gastric cancer, soft tissue sar sarcoma and melanoma. Um, he is also the principal investigator of the Washington University Participant Engagement and Cancer Genome Sequencing Center, which is what we're here to learn about today. So I will hand it over to you, Dr. Fields. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Zach, and, and for really giving us a, a platform to talk about this uh, exciting uh, study. I'm going to uh, share my screen here so you can see my slides. Um, Melissa, are those looking okay? Yes, they, they look good. Thank you. Great. So I'm going to talk about, it's a mouthful, I know, um, so I'll abbreviate it, but the Participant Engagement in Cancer Genome Sequencing Cancer Moonshot Program here at WashU. Um, and I'll, I'll give a little background uh, about how this is relevant to your group and fight colorectal cancer and why we're so excited about this um, and where it came from out of the Cancer Moonshot uh, Program through the National Cancer Institute. So again, I'm Ryan Fields. I'm really presenting this on, on the half of a very large team that I'll, I'll mention um, because it's a, it's a pretty big and ambitious project and a project that there's no way for us to really accomplish and meet the, the goals of this project, both at WashU, but also nationally without the help of groups like uh, Fight CRC. So um, just by way of starting, no disclosures, I have no conflicts of interest and I'm not gonna talk about any off-label use of drugs or therapeutics. Um, so cancer moonshot, people have, I think, heard a lot about this. Um, it's very relevant to the current funding uh, of cancer research. It was started back in 2015 when then President Obama turned to then Vice President uh, uh, Joe Biden and said uh, um, during his State of the Union in October of 2015, we're going to put a lot of money into cancer uh, in the next uh, uh, Congressional Funding Act. And uh, uh, Joe, I'm going to put you in charge of it because of your personal history of cancer. So. Um, when that came up, um, the first thing that uh, Biden and his team did, it says, well, we got uh, this billion dollars. How, how should we spend it? So he assembled a blue ribbon panel, a group of cancer experts around the country. Um, and this was across the spectrum of basic scientists who were studying molecules in the laboratory to epidemiologists who were looking at large trends and said, where are the biggest areas of need? And this was really uh, uh, paralleled uh, from President Kennedy's moonshot program of I'm going to give you a goal of landing a person on the moon uh, and a date. This was, you know, we want to make a big uh, inroads into cancer within the next 10 to 20 years. So this is a snapshot um, from the cancer.gov from where you can see um, information about the cancer moonshot. Um, it, this is a, a site you could go to. It's uh, uh, not written for scientists. It's written for lay people to really be able to see where this money's going and the progress. And these were the research initiatives listed here that the blue ribbon panel really came up with. You can see there's a number of them, um, everything from creating an immunotherapy network to pediatric cancers. And what we're gonna talk about today is this one they came up with that was establish a network for direct patient engagement. And the subline says, engage patients to contribute their comprehensive tumor profile, so cancer genomics, to expand knowledge about what therapies work, in whom, and in which types of cancer. So if you click on that link, you can see a little bit more information about it. Um, but the way I really like to describe this initiative is what the Blue Ribbon Panel noted was in almost every cancer type, if you looked at all of the studies, whether it was breast cancer or colon cancer, most of the studies of, of, uh, of therapy A versus therapy B or a new diagnostic um, were really overrepresented by uh, uh, white people and in particular by white upper middle class people. And so we were making treatment decisions on 
women, on minorities, on people from rural areas, based on studies that were not done in, in people that represented them. And if we kind of look at more rare tumors, we just didn't have a way to study very rare tumors. And there was also the notion at the same time, sort of in parallel, that a lot of minority patients did not participate in, in trials and whether that was because they weren't approached or because they were approached and said no for reasons that weren't all that well understood. This was a, an area really of unmet need. And you know, it, it shouldn't surprise us that then we look at certain therapies and they don't work in certain patient groups and certain populations and we don't really understand why. So that's kind of a big picture, uh, I think, reason of why this initiative was started and why money was pumped into this. Um, so um, this network, and it's a network because it's around the country, many sites, was to support the direct engagement of, again, cancer patients and cancer survivors as participants in cancer research. And that participant means even from the design of studies all the way through being actual research participants. There's, uh, you could use any approach you wanted to promote cancer genome sequencing to address knowledge gaps. So you, you could look at um, uh, a rare cancer, highly lethal cancers, cancers with an early age of onset, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in colorectal cancer, of course, cancer with high disparities, and cancers that are prevalent, again, in very understudied populations. Um, and so here's what we put together at Washington University, and uh, what you, I'll have you focus on is in the orange there is colorectal cancer, but we're studying three cancer types that sort of fit the bill, but in colorectal cancer, we're specifically studying colorectal cancer in Black or African American populations under the age of 50, because that represents such an understudied uh, area and an area of unmet need. If you look at almost any large study, and by large, I mean any study with more than a couple hundred patients, and this is especially true of some of the larger randomized trials comparing, say, adjuvant therapy or, or chemotherapy for metastatic disease, uh, they have, uh, have very, very low um, numbers of participants in this particular demographic. Uh, and so what we uh, uh, are attempting to do is realizing that we couldn't do this all in St. Louis at Washington University at our Siteman Cancer Center. We need to uh, make this a national study where people are able to participate from around the country and you'll see participation does not mean flying to St. Louis and having a lot of office visits and things. This is all done essentially remotely and, and, uh, uh, and as efficaciously as we can. Um, the, um, uh, as I'll get into, it involves engaging participants and, and patients to get them enrolled and interested in the study. It involves then uh, using a lot of uh, uh, research tools, kind of cutting edge population health level research tools and survey work to understand this process then doing the, the real deep genome sequencing and characterization of their tumors, returning those results to patients and participants in, in what we hope is a meaningful way and studying that, and then making this a real iterative process so we can really refine and improve it. Um, and, and with the goal being of, you know, say five years down the road or a few years down the road when we're done with this project is that we've come up with some newer best practices to be able to uh, enroll patients into important clinical studies. This is uh, the, the team that I'm presenting on behalf of, because this is a, a multiple PI or a, a multi-principal investigator project. I'm really fortunate to be at Washington University with this incredible group of people who work in different disciplines. So as Melissa had mentioned, I'm a surgical oncologist here at, at Washington University. Uh, shown in the uh, middle of the picture, there is Graham Kolditz. Dr. Kolditz is the head of our Division of Public Health Sciences and a world-renowned researcher in the area of implementation science and population health sciences. Uh, uh, to the screen right is uh, Bettina Drake. Bettina Drake is also in public health sciences and is an expert not only in implementation science and public health, but in particular in healthcare disparities research. Um, she's done some incredible work in other cancer types and, and some newer work in colorectal cancer. And then um, uh, Lee Ding to the far right. Lee is the uh, director of our Genome Institute here at Washington University and is one of the world's experts in cancer genomics. She's uh, been uh, uh, one of the leaders in uh, the TCGA projects, another large scale government funded uh, cancer uh, sequencing project. So really we have this cross disciplinary team with expertise across the board to be able to, to carry this out. But as I said, there's no way for us to do this at Wash U uh, in St. Louis. We don't ha wouldn't have enough patients to uh, study enough patients to see important trends and, and, and see important uh, uh, um, um, differences between these uh, groups. So we've partnered up with multiple patient advocacy groups, and of course, spike colorectal cancer is one of them for this patient population, but also with the cholangiocarcinoma Foundation, what I would say is almost a, a 
sister patient advocacy group to fight colorectal cancer, but in a different disease in cholangiocarcinoma or bile duct cancer. And then uh, for multiple myeloma patients, the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. And the reason this is so important is because this study uh, and this partnership will allow us to utilize uh, your expertise at fight colorectal cancer, your voices, your clout, your ability to spread the word about a study like this uh, around the country. And, and that's what we're uh, uh, hoping for and counting on and, and looking for uh, uh, partners. I've you know, been fortunate to live in St. Louis and, and uh, work and, and, and sometimes go for bike rides alongside people like Terry Grieg and other people who have been uh, uh, advocates and members of fight colorectal cancer and to be involved with the group has been so much fun and very rewarding. So this is just kind of a, uh, a summary. If you look over the years at the numbers we're trying to accrue. So by the end of the study, hundreds and, and thousands of patients across uh, the different cancer types. Uh, and, and so that's where we're uh, looking for this partnership. In the end, we hope to sequence the genome of over, over thousands of patients and, and do some really, really deep science into the, uh, uh, these tumor types, as well as do some really interesting work and, and, and try to better understand, again, the, the process of participation in research. And so, you know, to get a little bit scientific, what are we going to do? And a lot of people are familiar with genome sequencing with some of the commercial companies out there like Foundation One and Tempest and others not advocating one over the other, but just to mention them for familiarity. And so that's where we kind of get into this tier one of genome sequencing that you would do for, say, standard of care. So we'll be doing all that, doing what I would call sort of standard first level genome sequencing. But then we're going to really take a really deep dive with Li Ding's expertise into things like cell-free DNA and real deep single cell RNA sequencing and proteomics, so looking at the proteins, not just the DNA and RNA, and then doing what I would call some real high resolution, what we call cellular imaging, where you can look at the microscopic level, but instead of just looking at the light microscope and picking out cancer cells, you can look into the genomics of those cells and really understand, well, why is this cancer cell next to this white blood cell? Is that because the white blood cell is about to kill the cancer cell or because the cancer cell telling the white blood cell, leave me alone, and really will allow us to identify not only the genomics, but what we call the spatial transcriptomics or the geography of a tumor and how that's important and relevant. And these are all things that you know are unbelievably cutting edge, still very research focused, but to be able to take colorectal cancer specimens in this group and study them at this level, we're, we're going to learn a tremendous amount. And again, at a place like Wash U, where we have somebody like Li Ding and her expertise, um, uh, to, to really be able to do this is, is fantastic. And then as uh, kind of shown on the screen right, there's a huge amount of informatics that integrates this data because it's you know gigabytes and terabytes of data that's generated for every patient. And so integrating that is a, a science in and of itself. And we have, uh, fortunately, again, experts here that are ready to do that. Um, well, uh, uh, this is just kind of, again, a schematic of showing some of the schedules and some of the different um, uh, uh, pipelines and work that we're doing. Um, but gives you a sense of the scale of the number of patients we're looking to accrue. Um, and then uh, what I'll concentrate on here is when we take all this data uh, and we come up with um, all this information, what we then are going to come up with are our reports. And then, of course, we'll have all the data for people with PhDs and MDs after the name to really understand the science. But we're going to produce a report that goes back to the patient and goes back to the patient's uh, providers and caregivers, really anyone they want us to send it to, that's readable and understandable at multiple levels. Um, the important thing that we're gonna also do, and this is in conjunction with fight colorectal cancer and, and some of the other foundations leveraging the work that they do for identifying and finding appropriate clinical trials if there's a relevant mutation or a relevant uh, therapy that's out there. And that could be a therapy anywhere around the country, but our goal is to help pair patients with the right uh, therapies. And that's gonna be something that's done you know, prospectively. And what I mean by that is if there's a cancer gene out there that we don't know about in 2023, um, that we find out in 2024 is really important, we'll be able to, in real time, have the data from, from say, a patient, uh, a patient's uh, sequencing data and say, hey, you know, this, this mutation which you have, we didn't know about when we did the sequencing, but now we do, and it would generate a report back to the patient that, hey, this might be important, and here might be some ways to follow up on that. But we also want the report to provide information back to the patient just as, uh, hey, you know, your, your research was very meaningful because we did X, Y, and Z with it. We're learning this from it. If you'd like to learn more, be even more engaged, you know, we're going to have some uh, different uh, webinars like this about the results. There'll be uh, a, a patient for, uh, forward sort of platform, uh, uh, web-based and app-based for people to 
see the results and see the results of this project again to, to show some engagement in the research and 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 then we we really want to study that uh, and what it means and I'll, I'll get into that in a second as well so the role of of this uh, other unit outside of doing the sequencing our engagement optimization unit is really to evaluate uh, participant engagement so from the second that somebody say consents to this study and agrees to participate there'll be some survey work and some interviews to really understand okay you you said yes to participate in this study you know what made you said yes? What are you hoping to get out of it? Um, what would make it easier or better? And then we also really want to uh, improve and evaluate the consenting process. So it may sound like a strange study when I uh, uh, mention it, but you'll understand why I think is if we approach a, a participant and they say no, well, of course, we're not going to enroll them into this study because they said no. But we do have a, a, a permission from our research uh, board here to then ask them, to, would they mind being in a, a follow-up study to understand why they said no. So no, we're not going to, of course, enroll you in this study, but we'd really like to understand what uh, what made you said no, what what uh, uh, rationale in your mind was there, and, and why were you thinking that? Because we think that down the road, that's really going to help us with informed consent um, uh, for any kind of study, whether it's this or a future study that's testing a therapeutic, to really better improve and evaluate the consenting process. Same thing with return of results. You know, if we hand somebody a, a a result, um, whether it's a paper copy or a mailed copy, or it's a text message or a phone call or however it is, um, some people will may find that uh, uh, um, acceptable and 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 have some benefit from that, and others may find it too too cumbersome or or not informative or not helpful. So we really want to improve and uh, evaluate that process as well. And we've actually proposed to have a randomized trial, meaning uh, uh, we kind of flip a coin of how we return results with kind of an expanded web-based education platform and decision aid versus standard process. And so we think that's gonna be really exciting to tell us if some of these tools that uh, we think might be uh, helpful could be uh, uh, really useful in returning results. So again, this will be a lot of qualitative interviews with patients and families, as well as patients who decline and some really sophisticated uh, work by Dr. Drake and Dr. Kolditz using some approaches to really understand a lot of the implications of this type of research, both ethical, legal, social implications to really understand the process. Um, one of the most exciting things too is having uh, uh, both patients and participants from the different advocacy groups be part of our Participant Engagement Advisory Board or PEAB. So these are participants and advocacy groups that really sit down at the table with us as we're designing these studies, as we're talking about the results, talking about how to improve the process. So yes, it's me and, and Dr. Kolditz and Dr. Drake and Dr. Ding and, and all, all of our uh, uh, scientific team, but it also inv involves community representatives, patient representatives, patient advocacy groups. Um, and so uh, we have a lot of room for participation. So whether you're a patient who wants to participate in the research study or potentially wants to be involved in, in, in our PEAB or other aspects, uh, as I'll say at the end, we'd love to, to hear from any and all. Participant Engagement Advisory Award specifically will give um, uh, input on multiple processes, uh, including recruitment, consenting, return of results. And these can be patients, but these could also be patient advocates, caregivers, really anyone involved uh, in, in this type of cancer. They'll help review surveys and research findings, really advise us how to best use these study findings in our approach, how to improve the process, how to share research, and really help us identify challenges and advise uh, and addressing barriers that we may not see from where we're sitting, but as a group, I think we'll be able to really capture the, the essence of this study. So again, we <clears throat> can't do it without uh, all of these patient advocacy groups and patient partners in, in this entire process. I mentioned that this is a really a national uh, effort, a network, a true network. You can see Washington University, <laughs> excuse me, in the upper right, but the Broad Research Center at Harvard, University of Southern California Research Center, Yale, University of New Mexico, and Ohio State are all uh, the other sites, and they're focusing on some different cancers. Um, um, for example, um, the University of New Mexico is not studying one cancer type, but more they're studying uh, 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 cancer types that are relevant to the Native American population in New Mexico across the board. So you can imagine uh, some very uh, different and unique challenges that, the, that they'll find. University of Southern California and our partners there are working in colorectal cancer as well, but specifically in uh, Hispanic and Latino populations. And we're going to really work closely with them to try to understand if they identify some best practices and we implement those in St. Louis. 
which would be true implementation science. Do those work as well here? Are there different barriers or challenges? So we really hope to learn a lot of complementary science between the two. And I could I put the website down in the lower right too um, that has a, a link to the uh, entire PECGS network so you can learn more about the different uh, programs that are underway and how they overlap and complement each other. If it's sounded complicated, that's because it is. It's a, it's a really big ambitious effort. And this slide is uh, kind of one of our figures that really walks through how this would actually work. So if you're sitting at home listening to this or you're gonna forward this to someone, like how in the world would this po uh, possibly work? So um, through uh, a recruitment process like this, through identifying patients, um, and I'll show you at the end how, how somebody who has interest can get in touch with us, then we would enroll a patient into this. And so uh, they would be uh, undergo surveys and some basic demographics. We can use a lot of informatics to pull records from other places. Uh, we can, uh, uh, our team uh, uh, of, uh, of research coordinators and nurses uh, 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 will do all the legwork to get records here and things. Uh, the other thing that we then do again is we get samples, whether it was a surgical resection or a biopsy or a blood sample, we, we will work on getting those from wherever they were done. So. For example, if you were sitting in Los Angeles and all of your treatment was done at UCLA, we would get all that from UCFA, UCLA pathology, work with your providers. So again, you don't have to come to St. Louis. You don't have to have extra procedures and biopsies. We do this from everything that's sitting in a freezer or sitting in a pathology bank somewhere. And then we get all those sent here and our expert pathologists and our uh, uh, informatics folks can then look at that, can take uh, samples from those, send everything back to where we got them from, but then do all that deep genomics and science here, do all of that work here. Um, and, and of course, be engaging the patients and participants over the phone and over Zoom and, and, and that sort of thing. We would then plan for our return of results via the standard methods that we talked about with some of our research platforms. Uh, we then uh, uh, return the results to the patients, make sure that their providing team and their doctors, wherever they are, have access to that data when it's actionable, meaning if there's something that we could do anything with, we uh, we'll work to compare that to any sequencing that's been done. Again, this is all part of a, a National Cancer Institute research project, so there's no charge to the patient. There's no insurance involvement with, uh, with this sort of thing. It's all part of the, the research budget. And then through, again, through some more engagement with the patients and the participants, we're going to study this process. Okay, we gave you the results. We've engaged you in this process. You know, what have you liked about it? What have you not? What were some barriers to participation? What worked? What didn't work? And then as you can kind of see, there's a refinement of this process and we it, it's kind of a, a cycle and, and the turns of the cycle may be measured in weeks to months. They may be measured in months to years as we get more people in there to, again, identify best practices. And what I really hope is that, well, what's the holy grail of this? What's the, what's, the, what's the real end game here? I hope that we're able to really, really deeply study scientifically some of these cancers, but I really hope we define some best practices into how we engage patients in research how we make sure that uh, research is done fairly and equitably and easily for access. And that you know someday if there's an informed consent for a, a clinical trial of chemotherapy in, in colorectal cancer, it has some language and some practices that we developed and that the network developed out of, out of this grant and out of this project. This is the, the last slide and this is kind of the, uh, the flyer that you might see on the website. You may get via email, you may see um, even at uh, some of your uh, physician offices, as we have people helping us to advertise, that really um, tells you how to get in touch with us. You can see the website, the email address, and the phone number there. Um, it really stresses that, again, there's no patient visits or procedures that are needed. And the first step is just uh, contacting uh, uh, us via any of these ways. Uh, Danielle, uh, who's our study nurse, and Hassani, who's our research coordinators, are, are kind of the people doing all the legwork for this and would be then in touch with you and, and, and getting things set up. And uh, again, this is something you can feel free to pass along via any, any way, shape or form to quote, spread the word. Um, there's no real limitation. The only real uh, limitation is this is still uh, right now open to people in, in the United States. So um, it, it, we can't uh, right now enroll patients outside of the US. That may change if we have a strong interest, but right now it's really anyone uh, who's uh, uh, living in and, uh, and participating and getting their care in the United States. Um, so I know that's uh, been kind of a whirlwind tour and introduction to this program. Um, uh, purposefully kind of tried to keep it at about 20 or 25 minutes. So we had some time for discussion and happy to uh, take questions and, and chat about this in, in any way. Thank you, Dr. Fields.
Um, and like you said, we'll go ahead and open it up to any questions. If anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask them. So just to recap, I know I just had kind of a quick question. Yeah. Just to reiterate, um, people that are interested, they can email or call that number or visit the website there. Um, would this be something that they would also need to tell their doctor about beforehand that they were trying to become involved in? Is it something that y'all would reach out to their facilities? How would that process go? It's, uh, it's a great question. Um, because this isn't a therapeutic study or would interfere or, or alter any of their, uh, quote, care, um, they don't have to involve their uh, uh, treating physicians. But of course, we would welcome it. Um, and we will automatically, uh, you know, reach out uh, mainly to be getting records and gathering information. And then the one thing that I, I didn't mention, but kind of goes into that is, is if, let's say, we requested um, a, a pathology, a, a tumor specimen that was uh, done previously, but that was really, um, there wasn't a large amount, it wasn't, uh, uh, we couldn't get it just to do research because it might impact their, their clinical care, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't use that. So this, you know, the first step is making sure that the patients, uh, any patient who participates uh, has everything they need for their current treatment. Um, um, so sometimes there's very small biopsies, but the incredible thing is, uh, uh, and I should say, you know, we've been about six months into the study and, and, and some of the work that we've done already, we can do so much with very small pieces of tissue. And then a lot of patients have had multiple biopsies. And so um, we can usually choose one over the other, or sometimes study both to compare the effect of a treatment on a patient's tumor. Um, so we can, we can really do uh, quite a bit with uh, what's already been done. Okay. Thank you. And so, sorry. So to touch on that, if, if somebody didn't have enough of biopsy material available for you to do what you needed to with the study, would they be able to submit to an additional biopsy for you? Is that outside the confines of this study? They, they could, but we would not, not necessarily ask for that because we don't want to put patients through other uh, uh, sort of unnecessary testing at all. A lot of times, though, you know, those patients would still be able to participate in the study because oftentimes, you know, we still want to understand you know, why they said yes and, and, and do a lot of uh, uh, work in that regard. And then a lot of patients may have future biopsies or blood draw that then we can get samples of uh, for uh, 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 when that happens. Um, so we wouldn't, uh, uh, if we got, uh, got a patient consented involved, we reached out to the pathology lab and they said, you know, we don't have enough of something, we would still keep that patient, patient really very involved in the research process. And then we did have a question from Rosalia. Um, I know that the target for this specific study um, in colorectal cancer patients is targeting the young um, Black patients, um, but if those are interested that fall outside of that demographic, are they still able to participate? What is the scope of um, like their participation in that? The, the best role for someone um, outside of sort of the demographic of the study would be to um, try to participate in our patient advisory board and be involved kind of in the, in the study and in the implementation and the return of results and really help advise us. And so there's a real opportunity there. We, um, we wouldn't um, um, be taking those patients, say, tumor samples and doing this type of work in terms of the sequencing just because of this area of unmet need and focus that we have in the Black patients under the age of 50. Um, but we would welcome really participation from anyone who's been involved with or or is involved with colorectal cancer personally or through family or friends to really help us make this study even more impactful. Got it. So their opinions still matter and you're still wanting their feedback um, and their help and their engagement, but not necessarily their tumor samples for this exactly. specific study. Yeah. Okay. And, and and, you know, we've, we've um, through some of the other patient uh, networks, you know, we've really stumbled upon some other opportunities where people have said, well, you know, I don't have that type of cancer. Or I don't fit in the demographic, but I know a group who's really looking at that or, you know, through my church group, for example, or something, I think I could really help spread the word this way or that way. And so, you know, you uh, fight colorectal cancer and your, your group just has such a far reaching network of, of advocates and of uh, almost a volunteer army, if you call it that, that's really um, passionate about uh, making a dent in this disease type uh, uh, in colorectal cancer. So, you know, any help that anyone can provide um, and, and any partnership that anyone can provide is not only what makes this potentially really impactful, but it's what makes it fun and exciting to do. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a lot of fun doing what I do because I get to uh, help and treat patients, but it's so much fun to also be involved in research that uh, works with groups like this and really kind of can see the impact and the 
far-reaching aspects of how patient advocacy really makes a difference. Absolutely. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I've got another quick one, just to make sure my understanding is correct. I know you mentioned that this isn't necessarily a therapeutic study, but if somebody joins up um, you know, to help advance the science and something is found that's actionable within their reports that does get back to their healthcare team and may, may actually impact their, their treatment in real time or in the future if something is found to, uh, you know, genes are found that impact cancer that we aren't aware of now that would be right. actionable in the future. Yeah, exactly. 100% hundred uh, percent hit that nail on the head, Zach. That's exactly how we would do it. And the, and the important thing, I think, is, again, prospectively, if something pops up that we don't know about today, but um, was part of the sequencing that we find out, you know, whether it's a week or a month or a year from now, we would then um, be able to return those results to patients quickly and say, hey, you know, this popped up, this we find important and, and relevant. Um, and so that that's sort of an exciting process. And and this um, randomized trial of looking at this new tool called the genomics advisor tool that takes that information from a patient's sequencing and generates a report that's written in very clear and simple to understand language with then what this means and what you can do next sort of things is what we hope is a, a really powerful tool that comes of this. Very cool. I was going to leave it open for some more questions, but I just thought of one. So I know that you said that patients don't have to go to your facility to get tested, that their samples will be sent and they'll, that you'll do um, the legwork on your end. Is there any other time commitments or any other commitments from patients um, that would be needed for this or just expressing their want to contribute, their want to be a part of it, and then kind of y'all take it from there? Yeah, we would take it from there and the time commitments for like the interviews and the surveys and things, there's not um, um, prescribed where we say, hey, you've got to then do this survey at, you know, Friday at 2 p.m. It would be, okay, what's the time that we can uh, call you to do this survey or that, uh, and then some of it will be web-based, but the interview ones we would schedule, um, you know, around patients to make it very seamless and easy. So the time commitment is, you know, almost all virtual, um, but uh, that the participation would be basically over the telephone potentially over Zoom and some web-based uh, tools and surveys. Well, one thing that we're going to um, certainly be doing is like when we have, say, meetings um, and seminars and things here at, at WashU or uh, at some of the national meetings for colorectal cancer, both advocacy and sciences, we'll um, um, try to have um, that advertised so that if patients or participants happen to be at some of those meetings or in the area, we could get them to come. Um, and certainly we'll have a lot of virtual options for when we have some of these things. Great. Thank you. So this sounds like an ongoing process and there is no necessarily set time frame for participation. Right. It's about, uh, the grant's a five-year uh, grant or five-year program. And, and a lot of these, if they show a lot of potential, you know, get extended uh, uh, or renewed. So um, we're kind of in the beginning of really of year one of, uh, of uh, a longer project. All right. Well, we haven't had any other questions come in. So um, if there's not anything else that, that we didn't touch on or that you're um, wanting to add, I think that we can probably, oh, wait, hold on. Oh, you're very welcome, Rosalia. She said, thank you for uh -huh. very welcome. useful information. Um, but yes, if there's not anything else, um, I can, we can maybe wait for any more questions. This is your last call. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course, please, yeah, be happy to uh, um, follow up with anyone via, again, any of the three methods, email or phone or, or web and um, uh, at any time. So we really look forward to partnership and, and support. Awesome. Well, we are looking forward to how we can support you in this and how we can collaborate and how we can help spread the word about this awesome network and this awesome research study. So thank you so much, Dr. Fields, for being here with us today, for sharing about the PECGS and all that you're doing for the cancer community. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.